there's somebody in like, you know, Sydney, Australia right now with a book in their hand is thinking about the world along the same lines of the conversation that we're having. It's literally us manipulating and maneuvering 26 letters into different arrangements that might just liberate somebody. Literacy is freedom. And so, so many people was yelling, you know, and it was wild to me. I was like, and this is literature right here. <laughs> you know what I mean? I was like, this is the importance of books. You're listening to Freedom Takes, a podcast from the Million Book Project. I'm Rihanna Milkar Scott, and today I'm stepping in to interview the regular host of the show, poet, lawyer, perennial student, Reginald Dwayne Best, <laughs> student of life. You know what I mean? Hey, look, you got you to gotta stay a student, man. You got to stay a student. So yeah, so um, we, we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, about Fallon and your your life as a reader. You talked about you know someone slipping the black poets underneath your door in your cell when you were when you were locked up, and and that's your origin. But I wonder what about your your um, your reading life prior to prison? Yeah, what was what was that like? Well, honestly, man, and I, I've been coming to this 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 more recently. It's like, and I've said it before, but I was kind of somewhat of a nerd. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I'm talking about like, I remember my first internet search <laughs> and it was, uh, my first internet search was how to speed read. <laughs> yeah. Cause you know, I have read, uh, I have read, um, Evelyn Woods guide to speed reading. That's one of the last books I checked out before I went to prison. And I used to be obsessed with those infomercials and, and I was obsessed with all of them, but it was one in particular that was supposed to be a guide to speed reading. And you would dig this. I don't believe I still remember this. So to, to prove that speed reading existed, they had the fastest talker in the world on a show. You know who that was? Who was that? Twister. <laughs> Twister. Yeah. So so Twister was on the show, and they had him reading the passage out loud really fast. And then they had the guy who was supposed to be the speed reading expert, and he was just flipping pages. He was just, you know, it was weird. Though. I was obsessed. And, and the thing I was obsessed with it is because even then I knew that you could only read so many books in his life. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to be able to read them faster. And I've read everything. I mean, the books, I remember reading Wake of the Wind by um, J. California Cooper and just being utterly devastated by how challenging it was to be black in this country mm -hmm. um, post-Civil War. And what it meant for these folks to rebuild their lives and, and to become you know, masons and to become farmers and to become barbers. And I just thought it was a wonderful book. And because I was reading without a filter, I was reading without a medium telling me what mattered. I was, it was just like happenstance that I would discover these things. And I remember reading Things Fall Apart and, and that joint breaking my heart. But yeah, I read a lot going into prison. And, and when I went in, I, I kept reading, but when I went in, it became less of a, I became less afraid to assert my identity I was like, I already got all this time in prison. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we already here. I'm gonna sit down on this concrete slab and I'm gonna read Faulkner. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm gonna I'm read Lord of the Rings. I'm gonna read King Arthur's Tale, you know? And so, um, yeah, I mean, and, and, and that made books a gateway to a world that I, I had been afraid of before I got locked up. You know, before you, before you got locked up, was it, was it something that you felt that you needed to, to, to run from, to hide? I didn't know where it would take me. And I was afraid of trying to go somewhere that I couldn't name. Wow. You know, coming, coming into a community where, um, I didn't know anybody who had gone to college except my teachers and my teachers felt like college was, was something that was reserved for the students who, who presented themselves in a certain way, who weren't ignorant in public, who weren't loud, who weren't like super sarcastic, who weren't me, you know, and so, mm. um, yeah, and so I just I don't know. I didn't I didn't I didn't have a full grasp or understanding of what um reading might mean for me. And it ain't that I got locked up and 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 got that. It's just that I got locked up and felt like it no longer mattered, you know, and like mm -hmm. and like reading just became a way of becoming, even if I didn't know the thing it was I was becoming. Now uh I wanna uh, I wanna turn to, uh turn to your to, to your latest uh book, Felon, which you know I I'm I love and I'm obsessed with. Before I ask any questions about it, let's uh Let's hear you read uh, a passage from it. All right, so I'm I'm gonna read I'm gonna read something and then um and then I'm gonna talk about about the book a bit. But I'm gonna read, uh, you know, when I was in prison and I was a poet, I, I didn't understand that being a poet meant that you should be able to say something off the top of your head. But I 
I've been working to memorize these pieces to learn about heart because I think it's important if you run into somebody at the barbershop and they say, let me hear something, you should you should be able to let them hear something. <laughs> be able to spit. Right. So I'm, I'm going to do this one. Blood history. The things that abandon you get remembered different. As precise as the English language can be, with words like penultimate and perseverate, there is not an exact combination of sounds that describe only that leaving. Once drinking and smoking with buddies, a friend asked if I longed for a father. Had he said wanted, I would have dismissed him in a way that youngins dismiss it all. A shrug, sarcasm, a sharp jab to the stomach, laughter, but he said longing. And in a different place, I might have wept. Say it once, my father lived with us, and then he didn't. And it fucked me up so bad that I didn't think about his leaving until I held my first son in my arms. And only now speak on it. Once a man who drank Whiskey and wild Irish rose like water told me and some friends that there is no word for father where he comes from. Not like we know it. There, the word father is the same as the word for listen. The blunts we passed around let us abandon our tongues. Not that much though. But what if the old head knew something? And if you have no father, you can't hear right. Years later, that same friend from before wondered why I didn't give my son my father's name. As if he ain't know. Some things turn your life into a prayer that God will certainly answer. Blood history. And so, you know, um, when I published the book, and it's wild, because in, in a lot of prisons, you can't get hardback books. And I published it, and some folks were asking me for books, and I realized that I couldn't even send it in to them. And I got this this joint right here done. And uh, and you see at the front, it's like Freedom Edition. And I wanted to get a paperback version that was printed up that I could send in the prisons and get to people as a gift. Mm -hmm. You know, because part of it is like, it's like who talks to us and, and I do deeply believe that books talk to us, but sometimes we need the writer to communicate to the reader that I'm talking to you. And so like I started it with a letter and, and, and it's just like I imagine somebody wanting to, needing to know that when, when we on this process of becoming, we can make a decision, you know, about, about what it is that we become. Cause so much of books, I think is about recognizing who you are and recognizing who you might be. Mm -hmm. And then really making a decision about those between those two poles. Can we hear the letter? Oh, yeah. I ain't even think about reading this letter, man. I'm gonna read this joint. Yeah. Dear, after judge sentenced me to nine years in prison for carjacking, the world grew dark. Six months before that day, I celebrated my 16th birthday. And before turning 18, I'd be called in a cell in a solitary confinement home. If you're like me, you recognize that this is an old story, a crime, handcuffs, a guilty plea, a cell, and more cells. But prison is more than that, too. The library didn't come to us in a hole, but there was an unspoken agreement that if you had a book that you could spare and someone asked for something to read, you gave the book to them. The single most defining moment of my life was when I asked for a book and a stranger slid the Black Poets by Dudley Randall under my cell door. The book introduced me to the poetry of Etheridge Knight. Like us, Knight had done time. Once he wrote, I died in 1960 from a prison sentence and poetry brought me back to life. The day that book slid into my cell, I became a poet. 22 years have passed since then, but I think a lot about the moment when somebody whose name I don't even know passed me a book of poems and a changed my life. 
ain't no real possibility of me catching up with the many people in prison that I build with on the yard, chop it up with about books, challenge and be challenged by. This is a way for me to say I appreciate that. I published a collection of poetry recently, and if you're reading this, you're holding that book, Felon, Poems. Consider this letter a kite that I'm tucking into a book being slid, slid to you. Take care, Dwayne. I remember when I, I, I visited a, a prison in Montgomery County, the young people there were, they were in a class, a writing class, and they were, you know, it struck me, he was talking about their relationship with books. It, it, it was like a social currency. It, it was like a social lubricant. They were, it was this thing that, that connected them. It, it sounds like you, it was a similar, similar experience in your Yo, I was, I was, in, I was, um, we were on a, on a prison that was locked down. And so you would come out of the cell and you're supposed to go get your lunch tray and then go back to your cell. And they had these yellow lines that was about two feet away from each cell. And you're supposed to not cross the yellow lines. But like, I'm a perpetual line crosser, right? So <laughs> so I come out and my man is like, yo, Shy, come here. He's like, yo, Shy, come here. And he has cell one, which is right by where the trades are. And the lieutenant is like, Betts, don't cross that line. And dude is like, Shy, come here, man, Fuck, dude. And I'm like, oh man, you know. <laughs> And he's like, yo, I got this book, man. Check this book out. And that was it. I was like, I'm going to see the book. So I go check the book out, right? Book probably wasn't even good either. You know what I mean? We was reading all kinds of wild stuff. But um, but I'm checking the book out. He slid it out. I'm looking at it. So disrespectful, right? You know? So when I slide the book back, the lieutenant's like, yo, turn around. And I'm like, for real? You seriously going to lock me up for this? So I turn around and put me in cuffs. And they take me into the Sally port, right? And so then they open up the next row of cells and my man Luke, which I wasn't even close to him for real, he kicks his lock out. If Shahid go to the hole, I'm going to the hole. All that man trying to do is get an education. You know what I mean? When it was like a bandwagon, you know, some dudes really, they, they were cool with me. And so they were serious. They were like, um, my man who who um, who I got the book for, he was he was like irate. You know, he was like, look, man, if, if Shahid go to the hole, I'm telling you, you might as well go ahead and bring the goon squad in, right? And so, so many people was yelling, you know, and it was wild to me. I was like, damn, this is literature right here. <laughs> you know what I mean? I was like, I was like, this is the importance of books. And um, and and the lieutenant was like, yo, this is ridiculous. And he took the handcuffs on me. He was like, yo, get in your cell, man. And, and stop crossing them lines. And I was like, yo, it was for, and he was like, get in your cell. I just went in the cell. And and I, but I think about it though, it's like, it was, it was currency and it wasn't currency for everybody. You know what I mean? It was, we wasn't in, we was in prison. We weren't in utopia, but, <laughs> right. but, but it was true though, that, that for some of us, man, like, like the books meant something and it, it was super idiosyncratic, you know, it would be like, I remember my man Funk, I ain't said this dude name in like 20 years, man, but this cat Funk, man, he, he just straight read romance novels and just like regular, just straight good stories. And I was like the block librarian. And he'd be like, yo, Shy, what you got this good? And I'd like give him some righteous shit. He'd be like, nah, man, I don't want to read that, man. You know, I ain't Tony Morrison, nah. You know, so, <laughs> and so I, I and, and I had to like learn, like the cachet was like, not just the books, but like honoring what people, what, what people felt to make themselves feel better than that cell did, you know? And so, and so yeah, you know, it was like, wow. And, it, and it's a memory, man. It's like, I had I ain't said this dude name in 20 years. And and the way I remember him, it's, it's, it's like tied to the books. And those are the dudes, I think, um, in a lot of ways, who I had like a much more meaningful relationship because the book was always a kind of bridge and a kind of location for things, you know? Mm. It was like books and sports, you know? Um, but, but, but the books, I don't know, the books hit. Books hit hard. Wow, that was, I mean, that was some great stories, man. Uh, <laughs> you know, you, you know, you talk about um, you know the, the things we don't think of, you know, for black men. You know, I, you don't think black men in prison reading nothing but romance novels, straight romance novels. You know? Straight romance novels. Now, um, you know, I've, I've read, I've, you know, I've been reading you for a while. When Felon came out, I went, I read both of your books together. Well, you, you have more than two, but I went back and reread Bastards of the Reagan era. I, I tried to read them together, but it was, they're just so different. You know, uh, in a previous conversation, you said, you know, you're obsessed with mass incarceration and, you know, that, that ties them together, but just the, 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 the language um, is almost like two different poets wrote it. Were you conscious of that when you were going into writing Felon? Or? I'm always thinking about how people say Dwayne write about something else other than prison. And I'm always conscious of like, 
how do you bring something to this experience incarceration post incarceration and in fact you know in a very real way bastards and felon are both like post incarceration experiences you know a lot of those poems come out of my experience teaching children and thinking about children children who were just behind me so who would have really been like the bastards of the reagan era you know like my generation is a lot of people getting locked up and and, and my dad's generation, a lot of folks getting locked up. And so, you know, that generation really is, you know, the bastards of the era, but it's not just the bastards of Reagan, it's the bastards of the era, which meant that like the community disappeared. You know, it wasn't just like our fathers disappeared. It wasn't just the state. It was sort of like uh, everybody left. And, you know, you think about prison, it is a way in which we have accepted that that like some of us can be written off even if it's for our actions, you know, like I carjack somebody, but it's a way in which the communities accept that, that maybe if we amputate the arm, the rest of the body will live. But those arms were in fact, like, like not limbs, but people. And, and mass incarceration is just notion that you could just lop off everything, right? And so like bastards was about those children. And felon, I think, when I wrote that, I was thinking about like me being a father. And, and, and I was thinking about a sort of set of circumstances that I was seeing in, in a fully different way just because I was different. So almost like I wanna write as if I'm stepping into the river and, and you just can't step into the same spot of the river twice, right? And so to do that as a writer, I tricked myself by developing forms, um, you know, writing mm -hmm. and receive forms and, and taking on kind of challenges with the writing that forced me to think about Something that, frankly, I just wasn't thinking about when I wrote Bastards. I don't know if I'll ever write another book of poems, but part of it is I just don't know what world I'll be confronting that demands me to write something different. I mean, I actually kind of do. I got a project in my head, and it's not so much of a project, but it's a series of poems on, on Black men and intimacy in prison and what it means not to be able to touch another and what it means to have everybody condemn touch as perverse. And then if I do that, though, I'm approaching something that I wasn't approaching in either one of the previous books. And so I imagine approaching something new will force me to approach it in a way that, that I just, I, I don't know. You know, I, I don't know how it's going to be. I'm going to be discovering some shit by writing it. I think it's wild as people would say, write about something else. It's like August Wilson said, you know, within the Black experience is the whole world. And I think within any topic, there, there's the whole world. And I think there's, I think there's a lot that, um, that you could say. Um, what I appreciate about you so much is that you are you're just a, a, a different thinker. You, you have this moral reckoning, this moral understanding that's born of experience that a lot of us focusing on the dogma don't have. So can you talk a little bit about this moral understanding that you're bringing that runs through basically all of your writing? I don't say this a lot, but it's true. Um, I don't say it in public a lot because because you aren't supposed to admit that you think people are going to end up in prison. But I remember being young and, and running with dudes and being like, man, I know this dude getting locked up. I know he getting locked up. And part of it was just drug dealers got locked up. And, and, and I say, like, conscientiously chose not to sell drugs. But also, I would be running with dudes and everybody's failing all of their classes. And I had some guys that I was around that was, you know, smart and doing all right. And, and the, most of the girls I went to school with were smart and doing all right. But what happened was when I was in, like, sixth grade going to seventh, I ended up going to one of the magnet schools. And so I went to school in a wild neighborhood, but I was in class with all of these people from the suburbs. And so my friend group was just like overlapping. It was all of these kind of super smart kids who had this messed up that this is a quality of education, but they had parents with cars, you know what I mean? Like and um and then it was just like everybody from the neighborhood. And I and I just actually really thought that I was in some ways better than the people that I was around, my, my peers, you know, I was like, dude, how did you get a 0, 0.0 something GPA? Like, like you, you worked for that. You know what I mean? Like, like, and I would look at them and, and think fully that I was like better than them. And, and I'm like, you know, I'm on an honor roll. I got a 3.1 and I ain't, I ain't did homework all year. I got, I've, I've been with you the whole time. And, and I just knew they were going to prison and I wasn't right. And out of all my folks, man, I was like the first one to get locked up. And and I've realized that if I was going to survive prison, I had to immediately recognize that I wasn't better than anybody around me. And I had went there so young, you know, I went there so young and I was guilty. And maybe this is why I resent a lot of what I hear people say about incarceration and people in prison, because it is a, a, a deep felt sense of like shame that I fucking went to prison and have to tell my son that I went to prison. 
You know, it's, it's just not okay. It is not mass incarceration. It is not the system. It is a pistol, you know, and like, and it is an absolute choice. And when I went in, I felt a deep sense of shame, but the awakening was to recognize that I was like everybody around me. And the one thing that many of us had in common, confronted with this silence and confronted with our own thoughts about what we wanted to be and what we had become, the one commonality that many of us had was being unsatisfied with what we were. And it is, it is like frightening to be unsatisfied with what you are and have no clue about how to be different. I was just in the game for a minute. I was 16, so it was easy for me. But you talk to like an old hustler or something. You talk to somebody who done been back and forth or been struggling with addiction, and it is hard and it is a huge challenge. And I think my allegiance is with those dudes. And having them as the people that I that I feel are like my family, my kin, means that I have to grapple with the challenges that they grapple with. I don't know if I have any more clarity at all. It's because I want to be accountable to somebody. And I'm thinking about everything that we did to try to become whatever we became. I don't remember if it was this conversation or the last conversation, uh, <laughs> but you talked about, you know, the, the doors closing behind you in, in prison, that, that sound. That's the that's a sound my dad always um, talks about. You know, it's like, you know, he could never get used to when you know, he visited his clients. Um, just the door <clears throat> closing behind him, which, um, um, you know, makes me think about the the guiding principle behind the the million book projects. Um, it's a help us get free. And Frederick Douglass, man, Frederick Douglass here said, uh, "When we read, we become forever free." So, um, what does that what does that mean to you? I mean, first part of it is just Frederick Douglass. You know, the 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 idea of of, of like one reading your way, and then two writing your way into freedom. Like the idea that reading can be the mechanism that makes you more aware of the conditions of your experience. That is just like, whoa, you know what I mean? And reading period is just eye-opening. It makes you aware of the fact that like right now I'm sitting somewhere in New Haven, Connecticut, but but like there's somebody in in, in like, you know, Sydney, Australia right now with a book in their hand is thinking about the world along the same lines of the conversation that we're having and becoming conscious uh, of that other soul on the other side of the planet is, is a really humbling thing but I think it's a, it's a sort of freedom inspiring thing. And then I think the other point though, and this cat asked me this, man, I was in a prison in Trinidad. Wait, Trinidad and Tobago? Yeah. Okay. And you talk about shook. First, they sent me an email to say, listen, we just thought it made sense for us to tell you this, but it's rumors of another prison break and you shouldn't be worried. And I was like, I'm, I'm never scared, you know? And then like two weeks before the event, I was like, let me click on this link though to see what they was talking about just in case, you know? I click on a link and they was like, Violent prison break leads to the death of one person. And I was like, ooh. But then I'm like, you know, I ain't never scared, man. You know, so I go, so I go to Trinidad. And when I go into the prison doors, it, the prison's right in the, in the center of the city. And the door's nondescript, you know, and they open the doors and you go inside. And I turned around, I watched them put the lock back on. I was like, I put that same lock on my gym locker. <laughs> and, the, and the lock, and the lock said, yell. And the lock said Yale. It was like a Yale <laughs> lock, right? Because it's some company called Yale. And I was like, Shit. you know, and it was the metaphor of it was like profound, you know, the same thing that make you free could enslave you. Mm. And, and I go inside and they and they they put me into it like a steel cage and they lock everybody in. I'm like, you just going to lock me in this joint? And so I sit down. And I'm just like, oh, Jesus, where do they got me at? This is this does not seem safe at all. And also, I'm thinking to myself, I'm, I'm, I'm mad that I'm feeling like it don't seem safe. You know what I mean? But they done locked all of us in together. Like, if it jump off, it's going to jump off in there. And I get up and I'm reading poems and I ain't getting no response from the audience. And I was like, what's up? Y'all don't like this? He was like, bruh, brethren. You keep reading these love poems, man. You know, and none of the poems was love poems. They was all like elegies for dead dudes. You know what I mean? And so anyway, they, I, I told them they could write their own poems and I would come around and talk to them. And they was all loving this. And they was like 80% of them was writing love poems. You know what I mean? I was like, get out of here. Right? <laughs> and so I'm going around person to person. But this cat pulls me to the side, man. He's like, star, let me ask you something. Nah, I ain't want to put you on the spot. So I ain't asked you when you were up there, when you were answering questions. But Star, let me ask you something. And these dudes have been locked up for 10 years without seeing a, a lawyer. You know, they have respected me because I've been locked up and then I was a lawyer. They didn't care about the poet thing, right? And this cat was like, yo, Star, been in here 10 years, man. I just want to know, 
have you ever felt free in prison? And um, and and I think, man, when I think about that quote from Douglas, I think what he's saying is that uh, books give you access to a life of the mind that can sustain you and, and gives you access to an understanding of freedom that is not limited to the construction of like physical mobility. And, and it is a humbling and a hard thing to accept. I mean, I know dudes doing life in prison, dudes did 30, 40 years. When I was inside, a couple of my mentors had already done 25. I got cats that just got out after 20. But to be able to sustain yourself in an environment like that, and it works so very hard not to become other than what you want to be, you know, demands that you believe that you are free. And and I, and I just think books is, is a pathway to that kind of freedom. And, and it is as necessary as air. And, 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 and you know, everybody has a, a gateway. And it's like, how do you give people the opportunity? It's like, like for somebody, it's going to be Juba. You know, it's going to be insurrections. But, but this joint don't exist in a penitentiary. Like cross, like f- the book, Cross River doesn't exist in a penitentiary. And that is like a profoundly unsettling fact that you can create a space, a location for freedom that can exist in your head. And when I read it, it exists in my head. And to know that mm. arbitrarily, it doesn't exist in the penitentiary. And like the, the Million Book Project is fundamentally about changing that reality, you know, because I, I, had it not been the Black Poets, I, I might not have become a writer. And it is it is it's just quite depressing to realize that something as uh, whimsical as the decision of a cat who I don't know to throw me a book that I asked for to so like profoundly change my life. Well, thank you for that. Um, always, always great to talk to you. Yeah, man, you know, I appreciate it, man. You, you, you doing your thing. And, and of course, you, you know, you are the first guest host for the Million Book Project podcast. And, and you know, you can't be replaced, man. Definitely appreciate it. And I look <laughs> forward to chopping it up in person. Thanks for joining us for Freedom Takes, a new podcast from the Million Book Project. We'll be back next time with another contemporary writer. You can find out more about the Million Book Project and subscribe to our newsletter at law.yale.edu backslash justice dash collaboratory. Our initiative was made possible by a generous grant from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. This podcast was produced by Aaron Slomsky Pritz with theme music by Reed Turchi. Production assistance was provided by Elsa Hardy, Tess Wheelwright, and Molly Unger. <laughs>